public wage bill has consistently remained above the 35% wage bill to revenue threshold, implying that it has been and continues to be fiscally unsustainable, thus shrinking the resources available for development and other priority government agenda. We are at 9,700 employees. Our wage bill currently is 1.035 trillion. Our revenue collection is at 2.2 trillion. Right, so those are the members of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. One is a commissioner, the other one is the chairperson of SRC. We'll also be listening to the Public Service Cabinet Secretary in as far as his thoughts on the wage bill are concerned. Do you have that? All right, we'll get it shortly and then we'll listen to it. But um, Dr. Rugo, let me begin with you on this yeah. one. Okay, now I hear that uh, the Cabinet Secretary is ready. Let's listen. Our wages our salaries, our emoluments, consume 43% of money collected. So if today we collect 100 shillings, one million of us will take home 43 shillings, the rest of the 53 million will take home 57 million shillings. This is a question of morality. It's a question of ethics. It's a question of, it's not even a question of, of economics and other high sounding principles. It's a question of selfishness. Our exchequer releases for purposes of uh, recurrent expenditure, including mandazis and uh, you know, uh, salaries, start at 75%. Very good. Because we are now at 75% on the financial year. So that mathematics is matching. Our public investment so-called as we speak, is 16%. Dr. Rugo, when you listen to the Cabinet Secretary making those um, arguments, there is a question of morality, um, it's, it's sort of selfishness on the side of the public servants. Mm. Is he facing reality or it's his guilt tripping, those that work for the government, bearing in mind that you actually have to spend money to run a government? Yeah, um, th thank, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think I must uh, state that it's important for us not to demonize public servants. Uh, that, that language seems to be popping up, you know, public servants. Uh, 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 you know, are, 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 as you're saying, you know, almost, uh, you know, the black sheep, they're spending too much. But let's go uh, a, a step back. The SRC has documented, and that's perhaps why you know, Mweshmua uh, even mentioned that they are not the best friends of parliament, where the wage bill seems to be beating us. And it is not in basic salaries, across board. It's not in basic salaries. It's on allowances that overlap. The last time I checked, they had documented at least about uh, 240 uh, allowances, which they were proposing that some of them are on the same thing. Uh, uh, secondly, is that these allowances are not enjoyed by the public service across board equitably. Mm. Uh, that there are certain people, there are people who never, for instance, if you don't travel, if your job does not require you to travel, you are always in the office, you don't enjoy this uh, kind of uh, 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 service. Of course, because again of grades, when you travel for view, uh, one is a cabinet secretary, the other one is a PS, the other one is a director, the other one uh, is a PA. You are, of course, not, even if you're going to New York, <laughs> you're not going to all get <laughs> the, the, same, the, same, the same allowance for mm. that travel uh, because of your card. But that does not, again, appreciate. You're going to the same place that has got the same costs uh, and the like. And, they, and we had that discussion, I remember, uh, so some, time, some, some time back. So the equity conversation has been the biggest. So first of all, the overlap that you have all these many allowances uh, that, 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 that overlap. But thirdly, is the fact that uh, there's been an effort and at sometimes no effort to actually sort out who is doing what. We'll come back to this discussion of productivity, but let me first of all just deal with the fact that you have people who are either doing same roles being paid differently, <laughs> Same level of role, whether at national level, uh, whether at county level or within the state corporations. Uh, then uh, you have others who don't do necessarily do any work. 
we've had them come. The ghost workers are those who don't exist. Mm -hmm. But the others who also don't do as much as they're supposed because they are either two, three of them. You know, remember the, the, the audit that was done some time back where they were found that for every one vehicle in one department, there were the three drivers mm. uh, equivalent. Mm -hmm. So you have all that mix, which I think is a critical discussion. Because when you look at revenue, what the CS is talking about, the revenue has been growing year on year. And I have the numbers here. The wage bill, the numbers of public servants have also been growing. The question is, have they been growing according to need? Or have they been growing purely because we now have a new government, I need to employ my people? And that's a very hot conversation in county. What's the answer to that? I think a good portion of the, a good portion of the employment sometimes has not been need-driven. You know, that this is what we are trying to address. And when it has been need driven, sometimes merit has not been considered. So when even people come in, you are actually having an overlap. You know, you have people in the roles, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, 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 that they, are, they are playing. And that seems to explain a lot of the challenge you find, for instance, at the county level, uh, where every new governor has come in and has employed more people. You know, without rationalizing, without even arguing out, uh, did we have sufficient? Is it that we didn't have enough? What kind of cadre? Of, of, of employees uh, 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 that, 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 that we have. Because when you look at how the wage bill has been growing compared to uh, national revenue, mm. the wage bill has been not been growing faster than national revenue. Yeah? Uh, they almost have been almost at, you know, in, 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 in tandem of sorts, you know, uh, or, you know, year on year. It's just that <clears throat> now uh, you have this population of public service uh, which we agree is less than, uh, you know, it's just about 948 uh, uh, million, uh, uh, sorry, 948,000, sorry, 948,000, according to the latest 2022-2023 uh, auditors, auditors report. And the fact that you're almost going now to spend a trillion uh, uh, on them, that seems to be the one that is raising. But lastly, and I will say more about this, is to ask if we are concerned deeply about the amount we are spending on the public service, can we answer the question first whether they are delivering value for that amount? Because every level of a country's development mm. requires different type of investment. If it's in education, should you continue building more schools when you don't have sufficient teachers? And not just teachers, librarians, you know, uh, uh, you know sign language interpreters for those that require, you know, uh, for the different able uh, uh, children. When you think about uh, uh, healthcare, should the focus be on building an, another dispensary or should it be on employing more nurses, lab technicians, you right. know, uh, radiologists, uh, and the like. Every level of a country's, so the, so the wage bill discussion, I, as I've said, the numbers have been growing. Mm -hmm in terms of absolute number of, 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 of employees, there is a question of whether we still need all of them. Two, the revenue of the country has also been growing. Mm. <laughs> so it's not like we are still at the same revenue we were every year on average, 10%, save for 2020 when we had the COVID you know, uh, time. That's the only year we didn't register. But every year on average, we have at least a 10% uh, uh, revenue, revenue, revenue. Revenue growth. growth. And Chairman, when you're having this conversation and the cabinet secretary again is enumerating that um it's 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 an immoral issue for one million kenyans who work in the public service to be the ones that are taking much of this what is the appreciation of yourself as chair of the committee but also at parliament in as far as the value of investing in the public service so that we demystify this conversation uh, like I said again, it sounds like guilt tripping anyone who works in government. Uh, well, uh, I have listened to the CS for public service. And uh, what I have to say about uh, whether it's a moral issue, we need to also um, acknowledge that uh, this issue of uh, sustainability of the wage bill is a thing that we need to ask ourselves whether it is true or it is not true. And um, the conversations that we are having with the, the doctors and uh, other public servants mm -hmm. should be uh, guided by whether as a country we can uh, sustain that wage bill and whether comparatively is, is what is happening in other countries in Africa or uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in the world. In the co Departmental Committee on Labor, we are on record as having proposed a uniform uh, human resource uh, 
management uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Because like uh, we have a uniform uh, procurement approach uh, in the country. We have a un uniform uh, public, public finance uh, management approach in the country. But we seem not to have a, a uniform human resource uh, management approach. And uh, as a committee, we have uh, tasked the, uh, the Ministry of Public Service to ensure that uh, uh, that is done. Because like uh, what Dr. Ari is saying here, uh, we have counties um, from the inception of uh, the new constitution. Um, county governments have been uh, recruiting uh, employees and uh, bringing on board more people into uh, the workspace without necessarily requiring, um, without, without any merit. Mm -hmm. They bring them on board just because they did the campaigns together, uh, their buddies, uh, they are used to working together in their previous uh, work environment without now considering the issue of uh, wage bill. But going forward as a country, we must appreciate the fact that we must live also within our means. Right. Uh, and uh, this is what the chairperson, SRC, is trying to say. And also the president has been uh, on record as saying that we must be as a country, live uh, within our means so that also we can be able so to... How do we do that? Because like you say, uh, every change of government, every transition brings on board new employees, um, or maybe I should ask the public, serv <laughs> <laughs> public services. <laughs> because look, um, every regime is coming with new people and the ones that had been brought by the previous one, all of a sudden they become permanent and pensionable. What is yeah. the policy like, especially when you're talking about advisors and people that help new officers to deliver on their mandate? Thank you, Sam. First, let me just appreciate the, the conference that is being held by SRC. It happened to be the third conference. So I'm sure they are going to reflect mm -hmm. what are the benefits of the first two conferences, what are the lessons learned, so that they can be able to imbue moving forward. Let me uh, sum, in 2013, when Public Service Commission, uh, the first Public Service Commission of the Constitution came in, in, into place, there were other, a few other co uh, constitution commissions that had come together. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started feeling, because of the introduction of constitution offices, county government, maybe more state corporations, the issue of wage bill became a question. And uh, we, we, we at Public Service Commission with the KIPRA, uh, that is the Kenya Institute of uh, Public Policy and Research, we started asking what are the effects of wage bill by the year 2014? Mm -hmm. And from the KIPRA, they actually said that the wage bill is not sustainable. If we continue increasing at the rate it was increasing in tw after the constitution and 2014 in particular, it will not be sustainable. So I agree with the chair of the, public, of the SRC that that trend might not be sustainable. Then they did advise through a study that uh, government reduces wage bill by developing a public sector policy, a public sector wage bill policy. Mm -hmm. Because unless you have a policy that really asks what, what, is, what are the issues in the public wage bill, mm -hmm. what is the situation analysis, what are other countries maybe which are comparable with us dealing, dealing with the question of wage bill. And this, the, we also, the other, if the, we are a public service, a wage bill that could be helpful because it would actually say how the national government is going to deal with it, the county government and other constitutional offices. They also said we needed to utilize the ex existing human resources. First, we utilize maximum the existing human resource right. who are already there. They also said that we needed to do a job evaluation and actually SRD went and did the first job evaluation where it was realized the civil servants were earning much less than the people in state corporation and the people in constitution. Mm -hmm. So how do you expect somebody working in state corporation who requires approvals from the ministry, the people in the ministry to support that uh, change if they earn less than what people in the state corporation uh, earn. So uh, quite a number, with the, because of the job evaluation, civil servants increment now, they are more or less, it's not exactly the same, but if with the state corporation, closer. They also said that uh, we need them to fast track registration on allocation of revenues 
and various expenditures. That means in the parliament, after coming with a sound policy, then you would move ahead to do registration on uh, how allocation of revenues and expenditure. Because even if you are saying which bill is high, it is, all these allocations come from parliament. But we have a registration that guides mm -hmm. how this is supposed to be spent. So I am, I am of the view that um, having this conference, it should move towards a policy. And it should also not be a conference for the third time. So that was 2013. That was 2014. 2014. 2014. We still don't have the policy. We still don't have the policy, but at least the job evaluation was done. Yeah. And you remember also 2014 with the coming of the new constitutions on offices, there are other issues. There, mm. there's, there is a public service uh, act which was established. There was also um, human resource procedures, manual, you know, what comes first. So I think, in my view, the most urgent thing now is to have a public sector which be policy. Right. And that helps the country to have a uniform way of implementing. Because even now we are having this conference. When it comes to making decision who implements what, it is still a little bit vague. Because yeah. if we had a policy, we would have an implementation uh, session, section which says which ministry which is state corporation, which constitution will be charged with water responsibility and held accountable. But right now, we can make recommendation by decision, but implementation of those becomes quite a challenge. So, so tell me about that um, <laughs> when regimes change and you have to get new employees, um, how do you deal with that? Because I'm sure you know that uh, many of them find their way to permanent and pensionables such that even when a new regime comes, it's just addition. When the new regime comes into, into government, uh, they, they, they are allowed, especially at the level of the president and also at the level of uh, CS, is to bring a few. And in, in public service commission, uh, regulation is like to, for CSS is like two advisors. These advisors are not supposed to interfere with the directors in that ministry. They are only supposed to advise a CS. For example, you get a document on finance, and I would like you to look at it and advise. But you are not supposed to go to the PS because in the government, the PS is the one responsible for running day to day management of the ministry, of the department. Perfect. So you cannot bring an advisor to be in the, in the complement of the PS. So in that case, then, you are supposed to, all staff in a department work for the PS. I mean, that's the one with that authority. And then the minister actually helps the PS to make decisions, which means the advisor, too, who are for the CS, would only help the CS to get information, to get the data, to analyze, synthesize maybe some of the maybe difficult areas that the, 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 the CS need to advise the peers so that the decisions can be made mm. and the action can move within the, the ministries. So we, it, the most important area in the public service is the existing public servants. These are qualified, trained, but sometimes they find an environment which sometimes may not be so supportive. So especially when you bring in new people mm. and then you don't take time to kind of uh, align them with, the, with, with the, those who are already in the, in the government. So what, the way I see it, and of course there's the politics and the interest that the governors want to bring some of the people they campaigned with or the people they worked with. But if you really want to save our public service, we should just try to work as much as possible with the existing staff and only hire where there is need. And that's why some want to say that uh, in public service, we all know that we have the Vision 20, then every department has got a, a strategy. Mm -hmm. In that strategy, there is organization structure. And that organization structure is what makes you place the staff that are going to work with you. And these staff are in functional areas. So if you, you know the technical functional staff who are in the ministry, then you realize that the ministry is not going to perform. Mm. And uh, with that in gray area, even performance management becomes a problem, productivity becomes a problem. But where uh, uh, the CS and the PS have deliberately decided to use the existing staff, you can find they are likely to make progress. So my yeah. advice would be for governors, for CSs, first utilize the existing public servant. In fact, there is a, a rule of the thumb that says 
No government is better than its public servants. So the better the quality of the public service by also attracting, retaining, motivating is what would make a government succeed. So, so tell me, who sets the salaries for advisors? They are also supposed to get the salaries of SRC. They will come, you know, in government, there is a grading system from to the high from the highest CS to PS. So and then the next level would be like level of PS. Advisor can come to the level of quality principal and administrative secretary or job group T, which is the level of a director or a secretary. So whenever they come, the public service commission determines using the, uh, the, 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 their qualification and experience and the papers to, uh, submitted to Public Service Commission to decide the CS has asked you for an advisor, maybe mm. a legal advisor. They look at the qualification and say, this legal advisor can come at job group T. This legal advisor can come on job group S, uh, on job group uh, U. So that the grading system is there, so nobody can come without coming to a grading system. So I I'm, I'm want to, and that's what we did, that there's a criteria on what even you, some if you are coming to public service, where you would be actually entering. Okay. So that, that, that and it, this is informed by the organization structure of the department. I, is it always adhered to? I, in my view, I think it is always at the end too, but uh, if there are cases where maybe someone has entered a higher level, for example, if you bring an advisor who is uh, maybe as, I don't, only the president brings an advisor at the level of uh, job group V, which is the cabinet. The rest should be actually be coming at levels that are below the, C, the PS. Okay. Yeah, to be able to harmonize and work together. Mm. Yeah. And, and Dr. Rugo, mm. w when you look at it, of course, many Kenyans, as they listen to the cabinet secretary, that is uh, Moses Kuria, mm. saying that it is immoral, it is not uh, the lower cadres of the public servants that are taking more money. In fact, even when you look at the travel expenditure, out of, say, <clears throat> 20 billion shillings at the national level, 50% is going to the political class. It is those that sit in parliament, those that are in cabinet. The remaining 50% goes to now everybody else, the close to 1 million workers. How do we make sure that that is tightened? Yeah. Because there still appears to be a bit of wastage in terms of even what amount of resources people mm. that have been brought on board politically mm. are able to access. No, no, it's true. Um, I, I mentioned that earlier and allow me now then to go a bit more into pay equity is perhaps one of the biggest uh, struggles we are having. And I hope the conference, uh, while pushing, um, you know, while trying to, uh, let's go for 35%, make sure we are within 35% uh, of our, you know, of our, of our revenue uh, going to wage bill, pay equity is a big, big, big challenge. Uh, because, uh, well, as, uh, you know, uh, 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 Dr. Kobia rightly says that there is a process, you know, I don't get a sense that that process is followed, especially at a certain, certain, certain levels. Uh, remember, these positions are also of the people who make the decisions. So then they don't need to get approvals. Then they make the decisions of what travel uh, needs to happen and the like. My sense is that um, we need to, uh, I'll use a word that's not necessarily an English word, decommercialize a bit of public sector uh, positions. Uh, because what you see, both at the national level and even at the county level, is that these positions seem now to be becoming a way where you go to make money, you know? Uh, and you see people saying, hey, you saw so-and-so before he joined government. Uh, he <laughs> uh, Now, you see the way he, he or she is swimming in cash. No way is that swimming in cash. And it's because of all the connections that come with these positions in terms of how much you influence decision making, uh, whether in terms of who, pe who people, which people get contracts. I think we need to disconnect uh, 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 such, 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 such. Uh, and perhaps the best contracts way- Contracts for? Sorry? Uh, contracts for tenders and, uh, and the like. So you are in a place of influence. Mm. Those positions are, are, are offices of influence. And I'm sure even Moshimo, perhaps in their committee, may have dealt with that. So that then, Positions in government, when you see people pushing now to join government, they are no longer pushing to go and serve. They're not saying that I want to go, you know, uh, and join, you know, uh, uh, the, the health ministry because I am really concerned about the health of the people. You know, they're telling you, and they are very clear. 
know, I, I deal with young people. They even tell me, me, I'm looking for just to become a procurement officer. Uh, and, and once I'm a procurement officer, uh, you know, my life has changed in, in that sense. That kind of uh, uh, needs to shift because that's the same challenge you see at the, at the, what do we need to do? We need to connect people's performance mm. to their remuneration. This was the whole language around the performance contracting discussion uh, that was there a while back. We, we, we have not necessarily followed that, uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, uh, j just to say that when I did my PhD, I actually looked at how we use that performance information, the evaluation we use, whether it actually informs the next promotion, whether it actually informs productivity and decisions like that. And I found that that information is never used. <laughs> you know, uh, it's collected. It's so, yeah, so performance contracting in whatever form we call it, whether you call it results-based management, whatever we call it, it has to be that Abraham is responsible for the, say, the devolution uh, uh, docket. There are certain deliverables that are supposed to be made on that docket, and his or her remuneration. And there are countries like Singapore that have done that. Hmm. Secondly, uh, for, 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 for Singapore in the, in the earlier days, which I think is also important, not only is remuneration, especially uh, of the higher uh, uh, levels tied to deliverables that they are going to perform, but it's also tied to the economic growth. Mm -hmm. So if the, the economy is doing well, you almost like get a bonus of sorts, you know, your salaries actually go. If they drink bad, the opposite actually happens. Uh, because unless we tie remuneration to productivity, to certain deliverables. Some here, I know, and I know it's difficult because in public sector, you know, remuneration is not productivity driven. If, you know, in where we work, in our places of work, if I don't meet certain deliverables, I'm not only not going to be remunerated, I'm going to lose my job. Mm. <laughs> Same case for you here, you know. Uh, but how do you assess uh, an agriculture extension officer? <laughs> you know? In fact, I was going to ask you, <coughs> does, Public service influence how the economy grows? In a big way. Yeah. In a big, big, big way. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at a minimum, public service still remain, public, public, public service is a regulator. Guides a lot of the regulation, sets the policies, sets the economic climate, you know, uh, by the laws that are passed. Take an example right now. With the current taxation regime that you have, it, not only, it, it has a negative effect, for instance, on businesses. Uh, because by the time you start a business and you see all the list of the things you need to comply with, it becomes, so uh, uh, whether you think about uh, 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 you know, the things that people would consider in terms of you know, uh, <coughs> the, the, the human development index, mm. public service is the one that informs a lot of that. Because they set the policies, they ensure those policies are being implemented, they set the quality standards, they are the ones to follow through whether those quality standards are being, are being, are being followed. Uh, they are the ones who negotiate the trade agreements. They are the ones who basically will set, as I've said, the taxation. So, so, so in that sense, public sector plays. But in our country, public sector not only, public service and public sector, I know we are using the two as though they are the same. They are actually mm. not the same. Mm. <laughs> you know? uh, public sector is a totality you know, uh, of government. Um, also, is the biggest spender in our economy. Sorry, I should say one of the biggest spenders in our mm. economy. Okay. So, uh, uh, and that is not supposed to be the case because you're supposed to be having more other spenders in terms of, you know, uh, a private sector playing a bit more critical role. And they are big spenders because, first of all, of just the number of employment. The, the employment, if you think about uh, just two categories, teachers and uh, pensioners. They are the ones who drive a big portion of the rural economy you know, because of the salaries, mm -hmm. you know? And, and actually it was seen, there's a month when salaries delayed right. for teachers uh, by just about six days. And it was hear and cry, <laughs> you know, across the country because it just mm -hmm. tells you how much that, and I'm sure Mwishmu also <laughs> deals with that a lot. You know, it drives a lot of that economy. So in that, to that extent, mm -hmm. uh, but let me come back, that unless we are able to tie, especially for the higher cadre of public sector officers who are also consuming a lot, unless we are able to tie them to certain deliverables, to certain outcomes, you know, uh, uh, for, for, for the country, then it becomes very difficult to rein it in. Because that then would inform merit, whether we are hiring on merit or not, 
you know, uh, the political advisors, as we say, uh, a lot of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps are not, are not interviewed. It's I come and I say I'm coming with some because he is a media expert, you know, uh, and the like. Then the PSC is supposed then to process and, you know, and the salaries uh, that come. But perhaps it could give us a better way so that then it's not that you don't bring advisors. Right. It is not that you don't hire new offices and the like, but that you're hiring them on merit, but on certain deliverables. Uh, as, as do. I see that as the way forward, but I worry that uh, perhaps politically it does not fly. That's why we still don't have a national pay uh, wage bill policy. Uh, because perhaps everybody thinks, okay, fine, I can fix it for these guys, right. but what about the day I am the one there? Would I want a free hand, uh, mm -hmm. as it were? Uh, so, 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 so that then, uh, unless there's a big drive, and perhaps now that he said he's going to push even some things that are contrary to the popular wind, uh, he can take that up. Okay. You know? <laughs> all right. Thanks. And I want us to listen to the SRC chair who spoke about productivity because according to data cited by SRC, um, the country ranked 153 out of 189 in terms of the productivity of the public service. That is globally. In Africa, Kenya was positioned 26 out of 55. So you can see um, how that, what that means. Let's listen to the chair of the SRC. Sent wage bills to ordinary revenue ratio, and thus making available more resources for development and other government priorities. Could you listen to that again? Because we didn't get what the chairperson is saying. All right. As we, do, do the public that? service productivity is a strategic intervention towards the achievement of the 35% wage bill to ordinary revenue ratio and thus making available more resources for development and other government priorities. All right. Um, of course, uh, the chairperson um, and also the commissioner, Monyoncho, was saying that increasing public service productivity can actually increase revenue and the ratio will be reduced or economic growth outpacing wage bill growth or manage the public service wage bill expenditure. So in a sense, that question of productivity is cannot uh, be overstated because if Kenyans have to continue paying taxes, and they're looking at, a, at an economy chairman that um, has the persons, especially in the middle class level, they'll be paying higher taxes, but they'll also be paying for the mm. public good. In this case, they'll pay for education for their children, They'll pay for the medical cover, whether through their employers or by themselves. And essentially, those are services that should be paid for by government. Mm. So why is the value for the pain felt by the taxpayer? Uh, well, the issue of uh, productivity in the public service is a very serious concern uh, because um, looking at the culture that we have in the country, uh, where it is easier to get things done in the private sector than in the public service, uh, arises from, um, uh, first of all, uh, the demotivation uh, from the issues that have been raised here by uh, my colleagues here. And uh, looking also at the issues to do with uh, the responsiveness of uh, the, the, the public sector as compared to the private sector. Uh, the government is supposed to uh, regulate or to facilitate the private sector. And um, by the regulation or f facilitation, um, that would uh, greatly help in, in the way that uh, businesses are done and uh, other operations are done in this country. So uh, the, issue of to, the issue to do with the productivity in the public sector can only get better if, uh, first of all, the, the the people working in the public service are motivated and they cannot be motivated if uh, uh, the salaries, the remunerations uh, and the allowances that they're getting are not uh, fairly considered 
uh, in comparison to the many institutions that we're having. Like you heard from a professor here, um, the people working in the public service were thought or considered to be earning far much less than those working in the commissions uh, and uh, the state co corporations. Then how then do we expect that the people working uh, in the public service will give us uh, better returns or rather they will give us more uh, for what they have been given? So for us to get more from the public service, we must also invest in that category of uh, the civil servants that you're talking about, uh, those the middle income uh, earners, so that they can also give us more value for uh, what they get in return. You think the biggest question of motivation is salaries? Uh, except salaries, we also have um, uh, the environment where these public servants are working because uh, most of them are not adequately fac facilitated. And, and uh, like you heard from Professor, um, like the Ministry of Labor is the home for all these issues that we're talking about, productivity, uh, wage bill, that is the home. We do not lack uh, individuals in that ministry who are capable of dealing with the issues that we're talking about. But the question is, are these people adequately uh, facilitated? And if they are not adequately facilitated, then how else can we expect them to give the most uh, of their stay or of their position that they are holding? Mm -hmm. So the environment that uh, the public servants are working in also contributes to uh, the value that they give in return. Uh, Prof, how do we enhance productivity in public service at a time, like he says, salaries or allowances may, may be a challenge, yet here you are busy dealing with a wage bill uh, revenue ratio. How do you enhance productivity within the circumstances? Uh, thank you, Sam. The issue of labor productivity is not very well understood in the public service. And I also don't want us to think the productivity in private sector is the same as the productivity in the, the public service. Why do I say so? You know, there is complexity in the public service. Mm. And uh, in, in this case, trying to say maybe uh, we are looking at how much input and output maximum can you get from each staff, either per day or per month. That, 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 that's the way it is. So even as the SRC is working on this conference, in my view, productivity is just one intervention. They, they, they need, we need to think comprehensively how do we increase, besides labor productivity, why we are trying to increase uh, performance of each of the, of the staff. Mm. Let's say like in teaching, we already have standards that a teacher in maybe secondary school is going to teach 40 students uh, for maybe eight hours. But you know, if they are less than 40, then you are not being very productive. So, but at, at the same time, let us not miss, when it comes to productivity, we can compare like private hospital and public hospital. In private hospital, it is profit driven. And the way they will be able to measure their uh, the, their staff, it is with credit of what is expected of you. When it comes to performance management, also there will be very the clear credit. <coughs> but in the public service, because there are so many interrelated kind of uh, interventions, then you find it is uh, some, it, in, it will need a very deliberate effort to come up with a productivity framework that actually will increase uh, will, uh, will increase um, or reduce the labor. The, the, wage, the wage bill. Therefore, uh, in my view, let's agree that productivity is just one, but we have just said, if the number of staff increase without any control, that will still push the, uh, the wage bill and even reduce productivity. We also have weak organization structure, where I, I think, as my colleague said here, there are staff who are not having very clear job description. Mm -hmm. So you can't even measure them. They need to fix that as well. The allowances, I see they have been dealing with quite a number of allowances, streamlining and lining them. I think I must commend them. But there's also the whole issue of payroll management, which is the best approach and framework for managing our payroll, not just in executive, in judiciary, in the parliament. That also <coughs> needs to be addressed. 
Also, he said, I think we need to peg this performance payment to salaries to performance. I think uh, performance contract trying to do that. But you realize in the public service, if we have not thought through the whole complete value chain, mm -hmm. then every link or weak link reduces productivity. For example, if you are going to a hospital and you have the, at the reception, you are, you are received well, maybe your vitals are taken, you see a doctor, but there's no medicine in the pharmacy. That also influences how our productivity is going to be. Therefore, and you can, when you are measuring me as a nurse, you cannot really say the customer satisfaction rating was low because if I went to the hospital and all the vitals taken, but I didn't get the medicine, definitely the customer satisfaction will be low. So how do you come back and then decide this is the way I want to reward the, the, the nurse? So what I'm trying to articulate is there's a difference between private sector mm. and we tried to borrow private sector management practices to public service, especially during the structural adjustment uh, period, but they did not sit very well. Therefore, I, what I'm thinking is still public service need to come together and agree on a performance management framework that's worked for public service because public service is about service delivery because service delivery is what Kenyans are looking for. If they can't get quality service delivery, I think is critical. I'm imagining this conference will also center in what is the role of technology in influencing the new world of public service. Because that can also help bring down the wage bill, but also increasing productivity. So to me, I think they, they, sh it is, they should not just think when we have productivity, the problem is solved. They also need to think about wiki controls and internal controls. And where there are no consequences, you know, in public service. If uh, you said me somewhere and maybe I was expecting to get fuel from another department, then there's no fuel. So you, can, so you can't hold me <laughs> accountable. So right. I think these things are so interrelated mm. that we must sit down and define what theory explains the situation we find in. We have made progress because I think through SRC, our wage bill was one time over 150, I mean 50 per, 51 per, or 53 percent. Yes. Then they brought it to 47. Now we are, we are 47. So there are some gains. So I think how do we but, come but, but up? But Prof, all that is because of the growth of revenue. Yeah, yeah. It's not because of so much effort. Yes, but at least when they did job evaluation and those civil servants who are lower and down, I think it also brought up, I think it also improved. Okay. And I would also say that uh, even the wage bill should not be looked totally as, um, a, a, as a negative fact indeed. Mm. Because this wage bill is the same that allows money to circulate to the sector. Okay. So I, I think, uh, and also, this issue of productivity at the wage bill, in my view, is not something that uh, anybody has a, a, like a bullet answer. Mm. Because in some countries, maybe like South Africa, they have looked at the wage bill, and the is actually, although their wage bill is high, it has no effect on their GDP, or there is that correlation. Okay. So I think it's important that uh, more time is spent to read and get the data and the statistics that will and device, mm. the, and this is not a SRC issue. It is the kind of all the three arms of government so that they will be able to come with a frame and address these other issues okay. that will affect the productivity and reduce the, the wage bill. So right, right. I think you've raised a very interesting um, <laughs> examples, especially on the medical sector. Now, I'm just looking at it, Dr. Mm. Rugo, yeah. that um, if you went to a public hospital today, yeah you'll probably, probably find a nurse to do the triage. Yes. After that, they're supposed to refer you to either a clinical officer or a doctor, all of whom are not um, at work. The doctor or the clinical officer should have sent you to the lab mm. who is not at work. After that, you should go to the pharmacy. or well, the pharmacist is also not at work. Oh, he's at work and there's no drugs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, currently they're on strike. Yeah, they're on strike. The right. pharmacist yes, and the KMPDU. Yes, yes. Correct. correct. Uh, so, uh, really, and there is dissatisfaction on the side of the recipients of that service. But there's another factor uh, that continues to affect the public sector, and that is the question of corruption. And recently, the ACC released a survey looking at the national average uh, bribery. I can imagine that we're even able to measure that uh, to an extent that if you needed to apply for a passport, you will need an average of um, 74,000 shillings in bribe, never mind the, the 
uh, the passport will cost you uh, way lower than that. I mean, what do you do with this question? Because every regime comes in and says that you're going to deal with this. In fact, the paper today is saying that there are no, f there are no uh, sacred cows in the fertilizer scandal. Mm. And all this is being handled in the public sector. Um, never mind the consequences, uh, like she's saying here, um, not many people are facing, facing them. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I was hoping we'll actually get there because I was hoping this conversation will get us there because we have talked about all, from a technical angle, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with Prof on what needs to be done. But there are other things that do not necessarily require conversation because one of those is something that Prof has touched on and I think I need to mention it again, is that there are no consequences for wrongdoing. As long as there is no rule of law, which is what the big word for it is that there is rule of law, all countries in the world, including the ones that we admire, are not where they are because they have good people in charge. But it's because there is adherence to the rule of law, mm. uh, where people are held accountable for their decisions, for their actions, uh, and uh, in some places, even for their, uh, their, their, their unintended consequences of their actions. You know, I remember one time, I think in South Korea, a train had an accident and the minister resigned. Uh, the minister is not the one responsible for, you know, for setting the train system, but he, right. it is considered that he has a personal responsibility, it was a he then, that has a personal responsibility. So I think we must, there must be consequences. Uh, there cannot be, it cannot be a free fall. And right now the concern is that there's no, I was talking to somebody yesterday and he was saying, wow, nowadays it's like, it's accepted. You know, when you're budgeting for anything, uh, you know, no, actually I was talking to a friend who actually, you know, had a, had a, had a BQ provided for, for his construction. And there was a figure there. Then he asked, but this figure is not matching any of the other items. And he was told that is facilitation fee. <laughs> he said, oh. okay, fine. Even if it's a facilitation fee, I'm not paying it. I'm willing to wait. I'll go to that board. <laughs> facilitation for what? For the approvals, it's a construction. For the approvals that need to be done, uh, uh, so he will, they, the guy was like, no, you know, when we go to NCA, we will need to facilitate. When we go to this place, we will need to facilitate. The county, there will need to be facilitation. <coughs> and the guy said, no, I'm willing to go there. You know? Uh, and these are people who are paid to consider the approvals? Precisely. Precisely. I talk to any business person, they will they're tell you. The wage they will, yeah, they, they, yes. <laughs> they are part of the wage bill. They are being paid a salary. Unless we rein in corruption, uh, and not just the big scandals, but also the day-to-day, -day, because that's what affects the Kenyans uh, on a day-to-day on a, on a day basis. For me, that will be my take, because mm. that does not require con conversation, that does not require a conference, that requires action, you know, uh, and, 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 and it's, But secondly, is that Kenyans are troubled about wage bill because they are not seeing the services in return. I think that's where the big concern is right now. You know, as you have said, even when the doctors and nurses were not necessarily on strike, there are times you go to a facility. I remember taking my uncle to a health center and we, we, we basically just found the clerk. He said the nurse is yet to come. Uh, this was at noon. Uh, the nurse is yet to come. Uh, uh, you know, the, and we had to rush him to a private uh, hospital. Unfortunately, he succumbed. But, uh, you know, being even present, you know, uh, uh, the Ministry of Health did, did uh, an analysis some time back, and the absent, uh, uh, absenteeism was at, at, in some facilities was up to 50%, which means <laughs> there's nobody for 50% of the time, which is, which, is, which, which is concerning. But lastly... Wait, were they absent because there was no work to do, or they, no, no. they don't want to work? But who else is running the private facilities that we are talking about? You know, we don't have two sets of doctors and nurses. There are very few. There are still many health workers and this is the example we have, who still are on the government payroll, mm. they are on the government, uh, but they are still the ones who run the facilities. Right. You know, uh, you know uh, and, and then you have cases where you go and you're told, Dr. Hayuko, but if you go to this place, I've had an experience like that, you will find you know, that doctor you know, uh, who are running. So that then it's clear, if you're working in public sector, you're fully in public sector. Okay. If you're working in private sector, and for that, if it was like that, then, Sorting out the payment becomes a very easy matter because you say those are the ones who are present, let's pay them well so that then they are present. But let me say one last thing uh, because I see our time is running out. Part of the conversation at the wage bill conference and any other conference that will be held on this matter is to ask what is development? 
And I want to say that development is not brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Development in the education sector, the smallest development in that sector is building of the classroom and the library. The development after that is a teacher who is present, a librarian who is present, books that are well provided, chalk that is available, experiment equipment, and the like. All that, part of it, and, and teachers, of mm -hmm. course, and the workers. All that is a part of wage bill, and the rest of it is recurrent. Because there's been this demonization, and I've had, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the chairperson, I've had this conversation, even debate with her, that we are saying we want to save this money to, for development. What is development? Mm -hmm. You know, at this particular point, a lot of the development we need in this country is human resource driven because that's the path we have chosen for ourselves. You know, we have said we want to develop, you know, look at even what is driving our economy right now. It's service sector and right. that service sector is people. You know, uh, is a hotelier who is receiving guests. Is somebody who is taking people around. And right. right. Thank you very much. No, yet, uh, Chairman, because we need to conclude on this, um, our human capital index is actually <clears throat> the best in Africa, but the productive, productive Productivity of our public service is where it is, position 26. Um, I, mean, I don't know what that tells us, but also what do we do to the culture in the public service to an extent that um, what he was referring to, the contracts or the tenders, people get into government for that. Um, people want to influence politics for that uh, purpose. What do you do with that culture? Uh, well, some... <clears throat> Just before I come to that, I think the conference that is uh, supposed to begin this week must uh, discuss the issues to do with uh, the employment of technology in managing the public, uh, I mean, the national wage bill. And um, I say this because I have reliable information that uh, the Minister of Public Service has forwarded to the office of uh, the ODPP. Mm -hmm. Uh, a list of 2,000 uh, people who should be prosecuted for earning salaries uh, as ghost workers. Uh, so for that reason, we, we may need now to employ technology to ensure that also as we try to manage the wage bill, uh, we also do not have um, uh, the increasing number of ghost workers because this is something that is prevalent even in very many counties. Mm -hmm. Then together with that, I must also loud uh, SRC. SRC ha have done something good for, uh, they, they, they have been able to bring down uh, uh, the, the percentage wage bill from 53 to 43. And uh, I agree with that because in the last parliament, we used to earn plenary seating allowance. We don't earn it anymore. There used to be ministerial allowance. Uh, it is never there. And uh, uh, even the MCS mm -hmm. are not earning the plenary sitting allowance, which is going to save our country up to six billion uh, shillings in four years. But going to what you've said, uh, I must say, this is a personal opinion that I have held f f in, in a long time, uh, that the, the process of generating leaders in this country is the most fraudulent. And uh, when, when Dr. Rugo, uh, talks about the tender, uh, the tendering systems in, in the counties and uh, in government. Mm -hmm. I understand him very well, because, uh, for instance, uh, if you asked any MCA, almost every MCA, the cost for uh, running for that position is very high. Right. It is going up to ten million. Mm -hmm. If you asked any member of parliament, most of them, not all of them. Uh, they spend a lot of money. If you go to uh, the gubernatorial... You didn't give me an average, it, but it's okay, carry on. <laughs> uh, it goes up to almost 100 million for some, mm -hmm. though that not for everyone. Uh, like myself, I didn't spend as much. Uh, if you go to the presidential elections, they are very, very expensive. Yeah? So we need to ask ourselves as a country, yeah, why do political leaders have to spend a lot of time, a lot of resources to earn those political positions. Okay. And then what happens thereafter mm -hmm. when they earn those positions after having spent uh, a lot of money? So any discussion to give them uh, an extra allowance, will it be rejected by the people who spent a lot of money to earn those positions? So um, as we talk about corruption, okay. we must have a conversation in this country about uh, the process of generating leaders 
okay. for our country mm -hmm. because those are the people who are supposed to make decisions uh, for posterity and they cannot make uh, those positions for pos the best uh, decisions if uh, they have other interest around themselves. Oh, all right, I, I hear you, Chairman. And <coughs> Prof, we are running out of time, but I give you 30 seconds for your final remarks on uh, <laughs> just to sum it up for Thank us. you, thank you, thank you very much. I think, uh, let me also say, public servants don't just work for wages or for money. Uh, that is already known. I'm not also saying they shouldn't earn a reasonable salary that enables them to do, to take care of their bills. But we have found that in some research that uh, public servants uh, is a calling. And in fact, one study was pointing as um, public servants would require to give them, be given an opportunity for, to do a challenging task. Mm -hmm. That builds them, develops them. And they also asked the second thing that they desired before salary, it was a supportive environment that they have a task to do, they have a supportive environment. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is the conference should help us move towards with that understanding without demonizing public servants because no government can succeed without an effective, efficient public service. That's my second point is on governance. I mean, all this must sit on effective governance. We find that the corruption in Kenya is like there is a corrupt end and the one who is corrupting. Mm -hmm. So we find even Kenyans have like normalized. Anybody looking for a job for a child, they will think there is something that is required. Mm -hmm. I think that should worry us and that even those who are not corrupted, if they got an opportunity, they would actually take the corruption. That is going to ruin, right. I think, the whole nation because every Kenyan knows the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Giving a bribe for a service, I think you are already influencing the public servants. Right. So I think we want to stop there and uh, really see that uh, corruption is a big, big problem. All right. But every Kenyan should be able, the f effective governance where we are talking about transparency, uh, yeah, kind of uh, accountability, integrity, we, that foundation that need to be the foundation step mm. for this country requires a lot of strong leadership and political will. Strong leadership and political will required for integrity and ensure that there's transparency and accountability. Thank you all for making time for us. Eric Mushangi Karemba is the member of parliament for Runyenges, but also the chairperson of the Labour Committee at the National Assembly. Professor Margaret Kobia, former cabinet secretary for public service, but also a former chairperson of the Public Service Commission, Dr. Abraham Rugo from IBP Kenya. Thank you so much for making time for us of this conversation. The conference begins at the Bombers of Kenya uh, this morning. I hear uh, Dr. Rugo is headed there. Um, that's our time. We continue the conversation, but up next is Matters Football on uh, Sports. It's, it's Sports Sporty Monday. Uh, football is on my mind for a specific <laughs> reason. Uh, because um, yes, Arsenal Tawe. My name is Sam Gitu. We'll see you again some of the time. Bye for now.